Hello there, Eddie Mercado here with BloodyElbow.com, and I'm about to speak with the 10 and 1 James Vick as he is headed to UFC 211 in Dallas, Texas to take on Marco Polo Reyes in the lightweight division. So let's give James a call and find out what he's been up to since his last fight. Maybe his thoughts on competing at home in Dallas, Texas. And maybe what he has in store for Marco Polo Reyes. Uh, Mr. James Vick, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for taking out the time. Huge fight on your hands. You're headed to UFC 211, May 13th in Dallas, Texas. Practically your backyard. How are things? I'm very good. I'm ready to go. I'm excited to fight at home. It's about 30, 40 minutes, like 40 minutes from my house. So I'm super excited and I'm ready to go. Um, next week, can't get here soon enough. Now, how did you even get mixed up into mixed martial arts and how did you link up with Lloyd Irvin? Um, I started, um, I, basically 2005 was the year I graduated high school. And I saw the Ultimate Fighter, and I was like, "Oh man, this is the this is the greatest thing ever." And um, I, w I went and played basketball for a little bit, and that didn't in college for a semester that didn't work out. And then I was looking for gyms. I didn't have a lot of money back then, and I lived out in the country. And I didn't live in the city. And then I found a gym about thirty minutes outside of Fort Worth. And I started training there, and then. Um, from there, I started boxing, and then later on, I moved to another different town, and then started doing jiu-jitsu also, and then moved to finally moved to the city where I could train more and focus on that more. And then I met Master Lloyd Irvin when I was uh, on the Ultimate Fighter. He was one of my coaches on the Ultimate Fighter. Now, Ultimate Fighter season fifteen, crazy season. What was your biggest takeaway from the show? Um, my biggest takeaway was that I I just I realized how that, that I could compete with guys had, that had been training their whole life and guys that had way more experience than me and guys that um, just I knew I could compete with guys that it was an eye opening thing that these guys had been training full time for years and I never trained full time my whole life and the first time the first time in, you know I ever trained full time and I felt like I progressed way faster than a lot of other guys just because I had never got, got that opportunity before. And once I was given it to train full time, it, it changed my life. Now, what do you think it is about you that kind of gives you that edge? Uh, like you said, I mean, you're, you're pretty raw. You're pretty like new to the sport, so to speak. But I mean, you're, you're hanging in there with top guys. Like, what do you think it is that, that makes you wise beyond your years, so to speak? I feel, well, I, I have no, I, I'm very, I have laser like focus. First off, you know, I don't have a million other interests. I go hunting and fishing a little bit every now and then I play basketball or something. But literally, I live, sleep, and breathe fighting. I don't watch TV. All I watch is fighting. I don't, I don't do a bunch of, I don't have a, a bunch of extracurricular activities, you know. And I, I believe I'm mentally stronger than so many of these guys. I feel like I break a lot of these guys. And, um, no matter how many years of training they have, like, for example, my last fight, you know, I felt like I, I broke Abel Trejillo. And realistically, I shouldn't be beating that guy. I shouldn't be – I took the, I took him down. I shouldn't be taking down a three-time NAIA All-American wrestler when when he – when I never wrestled a day in high school or anything in my whole life. And he was a, you know, a three-time all college All-American. That's, that, that's embarrassing, the fact that I could take him down. But it just shows you how much more mentally strong than I am the, uh, compared to these guys that I'm fighting. Yeah, now – your nickname, the Texecutioner, I think it's it's super appropriate. I mean, Executioner, your go-to move, the guillotine, I mean, you're catching everyone. Ramsey Nijum, you caught him like 38 seconds. Jake Matthews got the same treatment. What what is it about the guillotine that's that's kind of catching everybody? Well, um, I have a whole choke series, a bunch of chokes, my guillotine, Darce, Anaconda. And um I'm just, I set them up from many different places and I'm just ingrained. I have a system, me and my coaches, my coach, Master Lit Urban, my coach, my Jiu Jitsu coach back home, Master Cena Haddad. Um, I just do tons of, tons of reps in, in from different angles and I have different setups and, and I just, you know, I, I learned how, I've learned how to use my body. I don't really drill or practice a bunch of moves that really does is pointless for me. I don't, I don't do all that. I have a lot of catching up to do, you know, compared to guys who've, trained for years so 
I, 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 scut, I basically cut the bullshit and go straight to stuff that works for my body type, and it's worked out great for me. Yeah. Now, like you said, you caught Jake Matthews. You beat him at home in Australia. What was it like out there going, traveling to Australia to, to put on a show? Oh, that was that was probably the greatest one of the highlights of my whole career and the greatest night of my life when I won that fight and got the bonus and um, then I stayed an extra week and went and saw the Great Barrier Reef. Um, got the got the just go see the world for the first time like that. It was amazing until they hit me with that that Australian tax and then that wasn't that wasn't too cool. <laughs> was yeah, I know Uncle Sam can be a, a bit much sometimes. Was it was it that bad out there? Thirty-three and a half percent. Yeah. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> I, I didn't get it back. Didn't get none of it back. Yeah, it was horrible. Oh, that's tough. That's definitely tough. Definitely tough. But you did get a performance of the night bonus, like you said. Did you do anything cool with the money? I, well, I mean, I stayed in Australia for the extra week, and, and, and you know, and hung out and, and had a bunch of fun there. Besides that, nope, because I came home. Um, a month and a half later, ended up having to have hip surgery, and then didn't fight for a year again. So it, it kind of sucked. <laughs> uh, what what caused the uh, what was the need for hip surgery for? I had like a torn labrum and like an impingement in my hip. I'm not sure, honestly. I think just overtraining. Like I've had a history of that. And I've been really smart about that as of ever since that surgery. I've been really smart about that just because of the injuries, you know, that I that I've went through. Okay, now. After Australia, you, you faced a top 10 guy, Benil Dariush. It didn't go your way. It's part of the game. Uh, but it was your first loss. Was there anything that was like a big takeaway, like a big lesson that you you uh, you learned from that? No, honestly, I, I, I honestly, I just I just felt like I got caught. I felt like he he caught me. He timed um, a uh, counter punch right off a, a head kick and just landed me with a perfectly timed shot. And I felt like that wasn't the issue when I got caught there. It was the ground and pound. When I got hit on the, I got hit on the ground and I was, you know, several times and I was never able to recover. And I really felt like it was more of what he did wrong. I mean, what he did right than what I did wrong. I mean, obviously we've all got holes we need to fix, but I felt like in that particular situation, I just got caught and I can't go back and say, I should have did this different. I should have did that different. You know, um, I mean, I guess, you know, I, he, 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 his timing was perfect and he countered me and it, it just happened like that, you know? So I, I didn't really, after that fight, a lot of people were asking, oh, well, should I change this or should I change that? I didn't really change anything. I, I believe in the system I have. I just believe that, you know, I, I just got caught. Okay. Well, you bounced back with authority. Abel Trujillo, you know, he got choked out big time. I think he spent a, at least half of the second round in a Dars. Um, what was the adjustment that was made in between round two and three? That was that was it the flying knee that landed that rocked him, or was it was it something that you were told in your corner, hey, try this a little differently to actually get the choke? Well, the knee helped, that's for sure, because he was he was he was rocked <laughs> pretty bad. Huh? Honestly, it's weird because I, my arms are so long. I think that um, the first time, and able to usually a lot of muscular guys, they're easy to choke out because. They have bigger necks and stuff like that. But Abel Dribble was weird, funny looking, funny build kind of because he had a, he has a muscular upper body, but his neck wasn't really that thick. And I felt like I just shot the choke too deep, like it was too deep, and it was more of a crank versus a, a, a blood choke. And what happened was basically, you know, if you if someone gets cranked in, in class and jiu-jitsu practice, they're going to tap from a crank. But a competition or a fight, they're not going to tap necessarily. They're going to fight it more, and I felt like that's what happened. And then – the second round, I, I, I didn't shoot it quite as deep, and I pulled it back a little better, and I heard him making, you know, I was real confident after I uh, landed the knee, obviously, too, but I heard him making these real weird, weird noises and stuff, and I knew he was about to tap. Yeah, huge win. Um, and afterwards, you made the most of it. You took that opportunity to request to fight in Dallas. That fight was in Houston. Um what do you think about getting a, a home game now? Like you said, it's it's like what thirty minutes from your home. I mean, I'm excited. I'm so excited to have so many people come in. Um, uh, I'm just I, I haven't fought. I haven't got to fight it in the DFW at Dallas Fort area since before I was in the UFC. So I'm I'm super excited right now, and I, I can't wait. That, I gotta ask: Are you a Dallas Cowboys fan? Yeah, I don't really watch a lot of football, but if I have to pick a team, yeah, I got to go with the home team, of course. 
Is there any like added stress or pressure or like extra work involved being so close to home? Maybe like selling more tickets or like giving like selling t-shirts or anything like that? No, you don't. You don't really. Um, you know, it seems uh, you're fortunate enough. You don't have to push ticket sales like a regional show you would. Um, I have some t-shirts I've been selling. I've been letting my girlfriend deal with all that. And um, uh, besides that, no, I don't believe in all that pressure. And that's that's people who give it pressure are mentally weak. I don't really believe in all that. So I'm not, you know, I've, I fought at home before back in the day. And, I, you know, I just fought three, you know, three months ago in my home state. And I still had a bunch of people come. It was only a five-hour drive down there so to Houston. So I had a bunch of people drive there. So it, it, no more pressure on me. Uh, now, what do you think of your opponent, Marco Polo Reyes? We've seen him get tagged on the feet before. But you think you want to keep it on the feet, or you think you want to take him down and show off some more of your jiu-jitsu skills? I mean, honestly, my jiu-jitsu um, skills, like, you know, they're, they're obviously top level. But it's because all these guys try to take me down. I don't go in there and shoot doubles on them. You know, I, now, if, I, if something presents itself, I may take it, you know. But um, yeah, my game plan has never been to go in there and just blast double someone and put them down. You know, I think that I can beat Polo Reyes anywhere. Though I, I can outstrike him. I can stand and, and we can only box. You know, he's a he's a primarily a boxer. I can only box with him. And I think I can win that battle. You know, I fought. I came up um, boxing in, in tech in tech amateur boxing in Texas. I fought fifteen Polo Reyes. You know, and all I fought was flat footed Mexican boxers. So I've dealt with this style many times before, and I've always I've always won. I've always beat them all. So um, I, if I guess if the opportunity to take him down some middle presents itself, or if he shoots in for a takedown, I don't, I don't think he's dumb enough to try to take me down. I think he knows that he'll get submitted very quick, and should he do that. Um, but, uh, I mean, you never know. I mean, if yeah, I guess, you know, if you hurt someone or something, maybe they, you know, start changing their game plan of going for you know, takedowns or whatever. But we'll see what presents itself. But my goal is to get a finish within the first two rounds without taking any damage on my body. Okay. Now, how do you think it'll – present itself you think it'll be a submission or you think you'll get the the knockout i'm hoping the knockout i'm hoping the knockout obviously you know i don't have as many knockouts and it's funny it's kind of like nate diaz said you know when when he submitted mcgregor he's like you know i don't have a lot of knockouts because everyone starts shooting as they get hit um <laughs> the same thing you know uh my a lot of my submission wins um have came you know like when i when i beat jake matthews and when i beat abel Trujillo, those were submissions because I, I hurt them really bad and they started shooting in, you know, on desperation shots. So they left their neck exposed, you know? So yeah, um, hopefully, you know, I, I, I deal with a perfect world. I get the knockout. Okay. Now how's training camp going for this one? It's good. It's been good. It's, uh, I'm healthy. Um, every, everything's going good so far. I mean, this is one of my better training camps as far as being healthy for sure. Uh -huh. Who are some of the people you're training with out there? Um, I train with uh, uh, Team Lord Irvin, and we have um, several guys. Not a lot of UFC guys. Uh, uh, we had a couple other guys that were in the UFC, Mike Easton and um, Ron Stallings, but you know they got cut uh, uh, in the last year or two. But um, I have a lot of up and coming guys that I train with. My buddy, my my roommate Sadiq Youssef, he fights for Victory, and he's he's really good, really good sparring partner for me. And then um, uh, on long and song, he he's one, he fought for the one FC title uh, back in January, so you know I have I have some really good guys to train with, and I, I like the smaller camp environment just because I get more one on one help without you know without just being another number. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we see that with Mighty Mouse Johnson, him and uh, Matt Hume out there. Uh, I mean, you really see when when a coach really focuses in, what can really happen. Um, well, what would what would you want next? I mean, the UFC is really big on letting guys pick their poison, so to speak, call out each other on the microphone. Do you have any names or anyone you have in mind of, of calling out? Yeah, I'm saving that. I'm saving that for the fight night. So tune in May 13th. Yeah, I dig it, man. Absolutely. Uh, now, you know, you have a, a pretty tall frame for the lightweight division. Uh, they have you at 6'3", uh, 155 pounds. How do you feel at the at the weight class at this point? You know, it's very hard to make the weight. I'm not going to lie. It always, it's always, it's been very hard. Um, but I do make it, and I work with the best nutritionist. You know, I work with George Lockhart, and you know, he, he he's the man. He's the best, and he'll be out there. And it's it's never easy. But you know, being being a fighter is not easy. Being, you know, my goal is to be a world champion. That's not an easy task. And um, 
it's it's hard and eventually i'll move up you know eventually i'll move up to 170 but right now i know that you know i can make the weights and um i have a good nutritionist and it's tough but i always make it and i and i, and I always perform on fight night okay now your next fight are you looking to get out of texas or you want to you want to kind of stay close to home if they come back, if they come back to texas I, i'll fight as many as I, my goal is to get four fights this year this will already be two i'll fight another two in texas if possible uh uh, if they if I have to go elsewhere, I will. It's not a problem. Um, I definitely don't want to fight in any other countries. I really don't. After the way Australia taxes were, I could have literally. I mean, they took literally twenty thousand dollars of my money. I never got any of it back. I could have literally took the greatest vacation in the world to Australia and did whatever I wanted to with twenty extra thousand dollars. So I have no interest in fighting overseas anymore. It's 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 not worth it. Wow, and and there's like absolutely no way around that whatsoever. It's you just you have to pay the piper. No, you have to pay the taxes. And basically, I had contacted a, a a CPA that specializes in international income, and they put me in touch with the CPA in Australia. And they basically told me that if I would try to get some of that money back in Australia, it would have affected my taxes too bad here. So I was just screwed and couldn't do anything about it. Oh man, it's tough. It's definitely tough. But you got any uh, sponsors or people you want to give a, a special shout out or thank you to? Um, yeah, I, uh, well, my sponsors for this camp, uh, Toy Toyota, uh, Toyota of Irving and, uh, Gamma Labs. So yeah, um, thank you for them. Thank you to my management, KO reps, and then my, my team, Team Lord Irving, all my teams and all my teams I train with back home in Texas as well. Awesome. 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 Now, how can people follow you along on your journey? What are your social media outlets, your Twitter, Facebook, yeah, I have Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Everyone start following me on Instagram because my Instagram is low right now because I haven't really had it that long. I've had the other two for several years. Um, James, they're all James Vic MMA. James Vic MMA. Awesome, awesome. Well, James Vic, thank you so much for taking out the time. Marco Polo Reyes is in your crosshairs. Next weekend, UFC 211, May 13th. Best of luck to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So there you have it. The 10 and 1 James Vick headed into UFC 211 May 13th to take on Marco Polo Reyes. Go check that out. In the meantime, you can read me over at bloodyelbow.com. You can follow me on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. If you like this interview, you can subscribe to my channel right here. You can subscribe to Bloody Elbow's YouTube channel right here. Check out these interviews. Go be a good person.